Let's open up our Bibles to Second Peter chapter 3, and we will conclude this little letter of Peter's. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 18 this morning. Let me start with a story. You probably will not get the punchline, not because uh, you're not smart, because I'm not a great deliverer at giving punchlines with jokes. That's probably why you won't get it. But pay attention, and hopefully you'll, you'll see the humor in it. Uh, if not, you can boo. <laughs> On a road through a desert in Arizona, a preacher named Nathaniel Evans, they call him Nate. Important to remember that, Nate. Nate walked every day preaching to many concerning the end times. His message was, the world is coming to an end. One day as he was walking, he came upon a big lever. And this lever, it said, pull this lever to end the world. Okay, another key that you need to look at. So Nate thought, this is a great place to continue to preach the message. And so he continued to preach the message to the crowds. And the crowds really enjoyed his message, especially with the lever being there saying, pull this lever and the end will be coming soon. Well, as the crowds came and the crowds came and they began to block the roads and so forth, there was an 18-wheeler coming down the highway and he saw that he could not stop. So he had a choice. Do I run over Nate? Or do I run over the lever? And so as he was explaining to the highway patrolman, he said, I was coming down the road and I had that choice to run over Nate or run over the lever. And as he looked at this red smear on the ground, you can see that he decided to run over Nate and not run over the lever. And so he told the police officer, so it was was better Nate than lever. Better late than never. (laughs) I told you, boomy. Go ahead, boomy. There's there's a reason for that corny joke, (laughs) mishandled joke. Last week we we looked at verses 13 um, and actually a few before that, but 13 where Peter said, "Nevertheless, we, according to His promises, look for a new heavens, a new earth, which in which there dwells righteousness." And so we're hoping for the new heavens and the new earth. The context, again, is the end times when God will deal with everything and there will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth, and in that new heaven and new earth, there will dwell righteousness. In fact, we will all get along. We will have a great party. We will have no complaints. We will enjoy life and and everything will be hunky-dory in a sense at that time. And so Peter's still on that theme as he closes up here. And so my theme today is better late than never better late than never. It's better that the Lord wait that souls would come to know Jesus Christ because we have family members that need to know Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ alone. You need to know that in order to get to heaven. Better than never in that He's never coming because he doesn't exist and the end of the world is not coming. They've been saying this for a long time, the scoffers and so forth. Well, it's better late than never because never means never and you're living in doom because one day you will die. One day you will perish from this earth and you will stand before God. And so better late than never. Let's go ahead and read the the text, if you will, with me, starting in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward... To these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is, is salvation, also as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away from the air of the wicked." 
but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter kind of ends in a nuts and bolts, kind of reminding us of what he has said in the past uh, in the letter. So he's kind of ending it all, summarizing some of the points that, that he's been sharing with us. And so he's recapping in a sense. And so we're going to go ahead and recap. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that he's recapping is, how do you live? No, knowing these things, how do you live? How is your life on this earth? How are you reflecting Christ? Uh, if people see you, do they know you're a Christian? Does your language reflect Christ? Does your life reflect Christ? Does your home reflect Christ? Does your vehicle reflect Christ? Does your favorites on your TV channels reflect Christ? You know, how, how do you live? And so he says, therefore... In light of knowing that there will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth, and that one day we will all dwell in righteousness, and when this new earth and this new heaven comes, what will be be your life here on this earth as you wait for that day? Beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. The word diligent is important to understand there. Because that's an action word. This is, this is our part of what we need to do as Christians. To do something hurriedly, in a sense, is what Peter is saying. Don't be inactive, but be active. It implies energy, an intense effort to do your utmost for the kingdom of God. How are you living your life? Is it extreme? Is it with effort? Is it with, with um, force? And, and do you see the importance of getting it done? Is what Peter is saying here. That we need to be diligent to be found by Him in peace. To be found in Him in peace. Now Jesus encourages us uh, also in Luke chapter 12, very similar to what Peter does here as he spoke to his disciples. He said, therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise servant or steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes and so jesus encouraging the disciples look you need to be a good steward i have entrusted you with certain gifts and certain rights and so you need to be faithful with those things that i have entrusted you with paul likewise prayed for the saints in thessalonica and he said now may the god of peace himself sanctify you entirely Sanctification means setting you apart for the work of God. And so may God set you apart for that work entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. John expresses a similar desire in his exhortation in 1 John two twenty eight. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. I I can almost picture that. How many, when they stand before him, will shrink away in shame because they didn't do anything for the Lord? How many will just kind of like, oh boy, you know, kind of waiting in line and, and as a person's coming up to Jesus and there's several in front of you and and Jesus say oh well done good and faithful servant and you know they go off to a certain direction you know to receive their rewards and another one well you were you were faithful and let's send you over there and well well you existed you know and you're going oh no I'm in big trouble by the time I get up there you know and you shrink away in shame oh you're saved oh you have salvation through Jesus Christ alone but there's no works there's no fruit of that salvation You haven't done anything with it. Your life doesn't show the evidence of it. Make sure when he comes that you're found in him. That you're found in him is what Peter is saying. Now what does that mean, in him? You know, those who love his appearing don't have to fear, don't have to have any anxieties because they possess a strong sense of assurance of their salvation. And the reality that they are 
truly Christians that have faith in Jesus Christ because they know that they are in Christ Jesus. I always liken it to being in a boat. If you're going to go deep sea fishing, you need to what? Get into the boat. And once you're in the boat, then you're in it. (laughs) You can go out there with them and you can fish away and catch good fish. But if you don't get into the boat, then you're standing on the pier waving as they go out and they're fishing and enjoying the day because you're not in it. And so we need to stay in Christ Jesus. What does that look like, staying in Christ Jesus as we live our lives? We need to make Jesus the focus point of our lives. He needs to be the center of our lives. We need to be directed by Him and through Him, asking Him in prayer, reading through His Word, in fellowship. Those are three fundamental things that that we need to do as believers to stay strong in the Lord. And so as we seek Him in prayer, important that we seek Him individually. We, We find a closet, we go into the dark, and we just pray unto the Lord for strength, for wisdom, for understanding. Uh, for power, for whatever it is that that we have need of, and keeping that communication line between us and God going on a daily basis. In fellowship with one another, coming to church on Sunday, coming to church on Wednesday, getting involved in those fellowships, the men's studies, the women's studies, and so forth. This is where the iron sharpens iron, in a sense, that the Bible talks about. Where, where we come together and we ask the questions and those questions get answered by the more mature women or the, the women that have gone through certain situations and have learned uh, uh, spiritual truths through those situations as God has guided them through. And we encourage one another in those fellowships or in the men's fellowships. But if we isolate ourselves and, and we put ourselves on an island, then we won't grow that way. We won't mature that way. We're not living correctly and so we need to fellowship we need to pray we need to read the word of god individually but also corporately together and it's important that you read it individually and you study it and you write down your questions that you may have and then you come to church and you wait and see if god answers your questions this morning i was just again blown, i'm always blown away how god just gets, just confirms things uh, my message theme is better late than never right and so I'm just kind of I'm always looking okay Lord uh, is this what you want me to to touch on is this what you want me to share you know just give me some insight there and so Roman comes walking in and he's asking some questions uh, to a couple over here and 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 all of a sudden he says wow better late than never and I'm like wow I'm like okay that's great okay Lord I, I know you're in this you know and then we're in prayer and Derek all of a sudden it says, it says something about uh, not changing the word, just, just finding a good church where they teach the word of God and they don't change it, they don't add to it. And I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you, because I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And so just the confirmation, that's why we gather together, we go to church. And then if you have questions, you know, sometimes it's difficult to understand the passages of Scripture without really digging into it. And then how do you dig into it? And what tools do you use to dig into it? You know, how do you uh, observe it and then interpret it and then apply it to your lives? And that just comes with, with time and experience and so forth. And sometimes we get a little frustrated because we, we haven't done that. I know there's a few have, that have gone through our inductive Bible study and afterwards they're going, I don't get this. <laughs> I just don't get it. You know, I, I'm having, it, it's uh, too hard for me, you know. And I think they want more than, than what they want to put into it. You know, they want to right away have a sermon ready to preach, you know, but they've only gone through it one time, you know. It doesn't work like that. It takes time. You know, it it takes prayer, it it takes commitment to go through and read and read and find the context and what is he saying and word definitions and so forth. Those things are all good. That's how we come to that relationship with Christ intimately. And so as John writes here as a reason not to be ashamed, he says, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Because we're abiding in him. So Peter continues and says, without spot and blameless. Now before you, you, you get a little concern here, what are, you, what are you trying to say? I'm, not, I'm supposed to be perfect here? Uh, am I not to sin? I mean, I, I can't do that. That's not what he's saying here. The word spot there means a blemish or defect and blameless means a fault of any kind. This is a work of the Holy Spirit that works in your life as you're abiding in Him. 
You have to abide in him, and then he begins to wash you and cleanse you and make you blameless. I remember when God was removing swearing from my vocabulary. I wasn't a big swearer, but once in a while, you know, he would just go out there, you know, and I would use a curse word to try to, you know, uh, get my way or express my frustration or whatever it is, you know. And God was trying to remove that from my vocabulary, saying that that's not proper, you know, to, to have uh, praise coming out of your mouth and then swearing, you know, at another time. Let it just be praise to God and, and glory to Him than, than swearing. And it took a, a while for God to do that. And I remember I had uh, been speaking to an elder at another church that I was involved in, and I used this swear word, and it's really not a swear word, but uh, we all have used it in the past, and, and we use it towards those that, that are above us, whether they're bosses or supervisors, and, and, and people come up to them and they get their way because they kiss up to the boss, you know, that type of thing. And I used the word like that, and I walked away, and I'm thinking, what did I just say to him? I'm like, oh man, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. But God taught me a lesson. Just from that situation, I went back and I said, I apologize, I shouldn't have used that picture, you know, and I used those words, and, and he's like, oh, that's so, don't worry about it, I understand completely, because he knew I was still young in the Lord, and I wasn't quite there yet. So the Holy Spirit has to work in our lives. Of course, we have to be willing to say, Lord, work in my life, remove these things that we know uh, are good for us, you know, remove them, those spots and those uh, blemishes that we have in our lives so that we don't offend man. And so remove those spots and blemishes. And then God's long suffering, he, he turns to God's long suffering. We spoke about that also. Look at verse 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And then again, you go back to verse 9 there, and we saw the long suffering of God gives opportunity for repentance and salvation for those who place their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, in a moment, I will give you an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I don't want to pass this opportunity up. That's why God has been late in coming, because of you. Because He loves you enough to hold off before He comes and say it's too late. You can't enter in. And if this is the truth, if, if what the Bible says is the truth, then you have a decision to make. And I'll give you that opportunity today because God is waiting for you and He's waiting to be very gracious to you. He wants to bring favors upon you if you'll humble yourselves under His hand. And now Peter now references Paul as he moves on to our next point. He references Paul. Paul's writing on the subject of the day of the Lord or the end times. He says in verse 5, Part B, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. The word him there, given to him, is talking about divine source. Uh, the wisdom that Paul has was not his own wisdom. It was wisdom that was given to him by God. Now, this is my favorite verse. I really love this verse. I, I loved it from the day that I read it. And I can remember, I don't know ex the exact date, but I can remember uh, over I'd say 20 years ago, even 24 years ago, when I read that verse, I thought, wow, this is awesome. This, this is so neat. Peter quotes Paul. And then you go to uh, one of Paul's epistles and Paul quotes Peter. You know, and the reason that I love this verse is because the Bible is its own commentary. The Bible references and, and interprets itself. And you don't need anybody's opinions. You don't need anybody's input. You can just read the Bible and you can understand what God is trying to say to you. Basically in that fundamental truth of, of why He has come to this world. And why He has come to you personally. Jesus quotes like 24 different Old Testament books out of the 39 that are there. The New Testament as a whole quotes 34 of the 39 Old Testament books. That's amazing how it, they quote each other. They validate each other. It is the Word of God, and you can depend upon it. 
Jude even quotes a book of Enoch. And in the Old Testament, there's a, another quote from another book that we really don't have. We don't have copies of it. We don't know if they're really canonical. In other words, if they belong in, in the Bible or not. There's debate over all of that. And I leave that to them. We don't have them here. But they do quote those books. And so the Bible uses historical books. Not, not as a, a reference of speaking uh, from God, but in the sense that they may have quoted the Scriptures you know, in that sense, you know, and I, I think about all the writings, you know, the, this, this senator, um, or I'm sorry, mayor, who asked for all the sermons, and, and now all these pastors are just mailing their sermons, mailing in her Bibles, and various things like that. All those quotes of the Bible are there, and, and apparently she's going to take whatever Bibles that, that she received, and she's actually going to give them to local churches. Uh, that, that's her part <laughs> of this whole deal, but I think of all the sermons that are going there in government and where they're going to be filed and where they're going to be placed and whether they're going to be uh, turned into, you know, uh, electronic filing systems and they'll be embedded in, in the government computers. There's the word of God. And who knows, uh, one day there might be even a quote, you know, in Mayor so-and-so's office, it says this, something like that, a historical. Not that it comes from God, but the reference of the Bible And that's what I love about this is that Peter uses Paul's wisdom to draw attention to the truth of the gospel, to godly character, and to the end of all things. Because Paul speaks about the end of all things in Thessalonians and James, or I'm sorry, not James, but but Hebrews and and, and Corinthians and Romans. He he talks about the end times and the millennium and and various uh, issues concerning uh, the Lord's return. Now, The reason that I like this is because it tells me the scripture is true and that I can trust in them and I can even trust in the writers of the scriptures, that they are not liars, they haven't made this up, that there's enough evidence for me to know that the Bible is the word of God. It is the word of God. Now there's so much more and one of these days I plan on going back there in Britain there's a library there that, where they store a lot of these artifacts of scriptures that, that date back way, way back then. And I'd love to go there just to be able to see some of them and be able to say, yeah, that does exist. You know, I can only say that by what I've seen on videos and, and read on articles and various things like that. But this place has things that would just blow people's minds if they saw the evidence of what we have concerning the Bible and the existence of Jesus Christ and the disciples in the early, earlier history uh, at that time, there's enough evidence that you have to come to the conclusion that this is the word of God. And so Peter's saying, look, you can trust in Paul's writings also. See, he says in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those or of these things which in which are some things hard to understand. Let me stop there for a second. He's going to change thought there uh, in a minute here. But he's saying, look, you can take Paul's epistles and you can trust in them because he has put in the time and the effort and they're divine from God and he speaks about the same message that I'm speaking about here in context concerning the second coming of Christ and the end of all things. And they're hard to understand. They're difficult to comprehend. In other words, they take effort to really dig into it, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. But there are scoffers who will take these truths and they will twist them. They will take the Scriptures and twist them to their own destruction because they have an agenda because they want a certain truth to be true or a certain lie to be truth or taken as truth and they will twist the scriptures in whatever way that they need to twist them to meet their needs. And he's speaking about those scoffers, those men that manipulate the scriptures. Now some Bible truths are difficult to understand. I mean, how do you understand the Trinity? We basically have to receive that by faith. That there are three persons and one God. I can understand it a little bit more because I've just dug into the word more and I see evidences uh, of God working and then all of a sudden Jesus working and then the Holy Spirit working. So you see these three different persons working in the life of the children of Israel and even in the church. And then you put them together uh, and you see in Isaiah 
quite often it talks about there being only one God. And even in John uh, chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God. And so you get these ideas, but how do you really explain the Trinity? You have three persons, but yet they're all one God. The Spirit is one God. I can't explain that. I mean, we try with the analogies, an egg, you know, you have a hard shell, you have the, the outer part, the yolk, and then you have the the yolk and the outer part, and you have three, and yet it's an egg, you know. Uh, water, it can become a solid, it can become a steam, but yet it's water, you know. You can come up with all this, but I still don't understand the Trinity. But we know that the Bible teaches it, and we have to believe it by by faith. And there are those truths that is just hard to understand. The The election, that's a big debate today. Does God elect, or do we have free choice? Is it, is it God who chooses, or do we choose? Do we have a part in that choice to to accept Him as Lord and Savior? Personally, my own opinion, and I'm making that clear, I believe that I have a choice to choose. But yet God does choose me, because He knew I'd choose Him. And because He knew I'd choose Him, He chose me. But He knows that you won't choose Him, so He doesn't choose you, because you wouldn't choose Him. So he, he, he chooses you according to his knowledge of knowing that you will choose him. You know? And you can go through this whole thing and, and try to figure it all out, but it's really hard to understand. And that's why you have theologians arguing back and forth on which one is true and which one is not. And so I stay away from things like that that bring up arguments. I just know that the scriptures are very clear and we just have to believe it. And there are times where we see... You know, if you receive the Lord, then you'll be saved. Oh, you mean I get to choose? Yeah. If the Lord calls you, then you're saved. Okay, so he calls us. Yeah, I believe that too. And you just receive what the scripture is saying. So these are hard things to understand. There's so many mysteries. The mystery of suffering. Why do we suffer? Why do we suffer? Why do little children suffer? That's a big one too. Why is there evil? Why is there evil in the world? You know, I just go back to Genesis. For me, that's, that's easiest. The fall of man. The sin entered into the world. It all started there. That's why we suffer. Some accuse Paul of teaching that, that since we're saved by grace, then go ahead and sin all you want because we're saved by grace. And that's not what he taught. And so there are some today that will take that grace of God, their salvation by grace alone, and they'll say, I can live my life the way I want to live it, I don't have to live with any rules or regulations. I'm saved by grace. And so they live a very sinful life, but they feel that they're still saved. That's far from the truth because the Bible doesn't teach that. Paul is very clear. He says, God forbid that uh, we would take God's grace in vain like that. Don't be troubled with the doctrines that you don't understand. That will come in time. Yes, doctrines are important. We need to understand them, and there are some that we need to believe. But they will come as you seek God, and as you come to church, and as you come to classes, and these doctrines are brought out in the scriptures and in the classes and so forth. You'll understand the virgin birth. You'll understand the resurrection. You'll understand you know, the crucifixion of Christ. You'll understand evil. You'll understand the, the Trinity a little bit more completely but not everything paul's writings is is difficult try reading the book of hebrews that's a good book even romans can get pretty difficult these are good books but remember our difficulties in understanding the bible are not necessarily due to divine error but it's because of our human ignorance because we're not willing to put in the time we're not willing to put in the effort to define words uh, to see the context and just dig into it more than what we do we want the answers like that right we live we live in a world today that's drive through everything's drive through you know, we got to have our meals like this let's just drive on through and let's get them so that we can eat let's get there so we can get it done it, it, it's all about quick delivery and with the word it doesn't come like that we need to spend time and i think god did that for a real good reason because he wants a relationship with you. He wants you to dig into the word and get to know who he is and not just give you all the answers. That's what's so neat about our relationships with one another, our our husbands and our, our wives, getting to know one another. I don't think you should just jump into a relationship, let's go get married. I think you need to know each other. Where'd you grow up? What do you like? What's your favorite color? You know, those type of things that you create relationships on, you know. 
And then based upon what you find out, says, I don't know, I'm not, I don't think I'm pursuing that, I'm going somewhere else, you know, because I don't like uh, some of the things that happen. Because then once you're married, that's it. You knew what you were getting into, and now you're stuck. So getting to know God, important. But there are men, untaught and unstable people, twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. That word destruction there is not annihilation. Some ha- and this is a whole other doctrine, the doctrine of hell. You know, that whole doctrine of hell, does hell exist? And today there's a, there's a thought that hell does not exist, or if it exists, it's only for a time, and then God will annihilate everybody completely. But the Bible doesn't teach that. You read the Bible and it says that you will burn in eternity forever, forever, forever. Jesus make references to uh, Gehenna. When you're standing there on Jerusalem on the mountain and you look to the left, there is, there is the, the, the valley of Gehenna that runs there. This is where they would throw their waste. And it was constantly on fire because they would burn it. And it was a reference as he looked down that, uh, of hell. This is where, where the fire is not quenched. It's, it's continuous and the worm does not die because in waste, in refuge, there's worms from flies and that thing just wiggling all around. It says that's what hell is like. It's eternal. So he's very clear here. And it seems that Peter is saying these untaught, unstable people who twist the word of God are in danger of destruction here. They're in danger of instruction whether they know the Lord or not. We need to be careful not to twist the Scriptures. You're only hurting yourself when you twist the Scriptures to your own benefit. The Daily Bread had this uh, nice little article, and you know the Daily Bread, we give them out here. They, they have little stories that are pretty interesting. There was an art enthusiast who displayed on his wall office a collection of etchings and so forth, and he had the Leaning Tower of Pisa there. And every morning he noticed that it was crooked, so he straightened it. Finally, one evening he asked a cleaning woman if she was responsible for moving the picture uh, because he found the tower not leaning, it was straight, and so he had to fix it, so it was leaning over again. And she said, yes, I saw it leaning, so I fixed the frame so it was standing up straight. And the point of telling this story is that some people are this way. They're in a habit of twisting the scriptures to make their own imperfect lives look better or justify their own opinions. And there's a tendency to do that when you feel that you're right and you reach out for a scripture to prove that you're right when in reality that scripture has nothing to do with your opinion. And you need to be careful that you're not involving God's word in your opinion because that's idolatry. God means what he says and says what he means very clearly. Apostle Peter warned his readers about the kind of people who do not approach God's worth with, the, with an honest motive and respect for authority. But they distort that message. And it will bring God's judgment on them. God gave us the word of God as a light to guide us in truth. Not to guide us in our way, but in His way. In a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm going to share a message um, concerning what is truth. There's a doctrine there. What is truth? And I'm going to share with the body what that truth is. And there's different observations of what truth is, but there's only one truth. And Jesus said, I am truth. But we're going to talk about what is truth. Uh, what did the Greeks say truth was? What did the Romans say truth was? Today, what does the culture say truth is? What about, what about social relativism or I relativism? What kind of truths are those? And what do they dictate? And how do they try to run our lives as truth? We need to fall back to what truth is, and that is the word of God. God, Jesus, his son, the death, the resurrection. God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible spells it out very simply that it is truth. And we find truth in it. And truth means it's God's way for our lives. Not our way, not the culture's way, not the social system's way. It's God's way to find truth. Distorting the word of God to fit our own preconceived ideas is a dangerous habit. And we shouldn't do it. 
Remember Revelation 22, 18? For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book, Revelation twenty two eighteen. Is God serious? He is. It sounds like he's very serious that you don't add or you don't delete from the word of God. So he closes his salutation here in guard yourself. Now, as we're waiting for the return of Christ, we need to guard ourselves. Uh, We shouldn't twist the scriptures. Uh, We should be expecting Christ's return soon, but yet we live as though he may not return today, and so we live that godly life that he desires us to live. And Peter says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked. Now, he references the previous verse there, those who twist the scriptures, and he basically warns believers here that you know the way you know the truth so you need to be careful that you don't take that truth that you know and drop it and then believe the wickedness of this world and then you become in danger of your relationship with christ is what he's saying so us as christians men and women who know the truth beforehand we can't plead ignorance because we know it we've studied it <clears throat> uh, i believe his name is os Ga- uh, guinness gray hair british type of accent I- i'm not saying that right uh, G- gus ganius os ganius i believe but he's a theologian he tells a story of arthur burns who was a chairman of the u.s federal board during 1970s and he was jewish and he became a part of a Bible study held there in the White House. And this man prayed, and this is what he prayed. He says, Oh God, may the day come when all Jews will come to know Jesus. But an even bigger surprise came when he prayed for the time when all Christians will come to know Jesus. Now, I read that and I thought, wow. See, we should know the truth but our lives reflect something different than the truth. And so through the observation of this man, he said there are Christians who call themselves Christians, but yet I'm not sure if they're really Christians because by their life I can't tell. So I pray that they become Christians, that the Christians become Christians, which is an oxymoron in a sense, you know, because a Christian becoming a Christian, wait, aren't they a Christian already? Well, aren't we saved by grace? Aren't we saved by belief? Yeah, we are. But the evidence, the fruit of that salvation has to be there. Well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, he didn't have time to show the evidence. I think that if you took that thief off that cross, the evidence would have been shown if he had the opportunity because it was a true conversion. God knew the heart and he went immediately into heaven. Now, now I'm saying that as truth, but it's an observation of what God did there. And it's an observation based upon the whole of the scriptures, right? If you were to take that man off, and because God said, you will be with me in paradise, obviously there's a changed heart there. And so the obvious conclusion would be if he came off the cross, his life would show it like Joseph, like uh, Nicodemus, like the apostles. The evidence would be there. We live in a day and age where you can't tell the difference between the Christians and the world anymore. And so... Peter is saying here, you need to be careful. You need to be responsible with what you know. And if you know something to be true, then you need to live that truth. You need to defend that truth. You need to die for that truth. If you know it to be truth. But too many are not growing. A teacher with 20 years experience was passed over for a promotion. Going to the administrator, she demanded, why did you choose that newer young man who only had four years experience? When I have 20 years experience, and the administrator says, you don't have 20 years experience. You only have 20 years of one year 
experience because you teach the same thing every year for 20 years. You haven't grown. You don't have no experience at all. And that's where Christians are at. Oh, I came to the Lord and that's it. They stop there. They don't move on. They don't have a prayer life. They don't have a reading life, a devotional life. They don't have a, a, a connection with the church. And they stopped. And they feel that's okay. And it's not okay. There has to be growth in our life. The church and the body of Christ is constantly growing. Paul likens it to a body, and the body is constantly growing. This part of the body may and may not grow, but the church is growing in other places. We are a part of the body, and we're growing, but very slowly. Something about this community, and and I still blame the community. I don't want to blame myself. (laughs) It's just this community is hard. I don't know if it's demonic or what. But every church that has come up in this community has either gone away or or just struggles constantly. And I think this is probably the best that we have ever uh, been at, you know, through prayer and just seeking God and waiting upon Him. And I know there's more to come if we grow up, if we begin to apply these things and we become mature in a sense and allow God to work in us. So we need to grow up. We can't stay babies. Can you imagine? If you were to stay a baby at eight years old and your mom's still spoon feeding you and you're going to high school and you're wearing diapers, you know, that's not very nice. <laughs> it wouldn't look nice, first of all. You've got to grow up. It's time to grow up. It's time to be mature. And there are, there are 60-year-olds who are acting like they're 20-year-olds, you know, and so forth. And so he ends with grow in the grace and knowledge of God, which is appropriate, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. So the encouragement is grow, grow, grow in the grace, you know, increase, enlarge yourself, take steps of faith, see what God can do. If you just take a step to grow, Lord, I'm going to grow in this direction. I'm going to see what you do. Test Him and watch how He will be faithful because He has grace, favor, merit upon us all. He wants to see us take those opportunities so that He can work in our lives through those times. And it has to be in the knowledge of God, the truth of God, and of His Word because He's our Lord, He's our Savior. And to Him be the glory and honor forever and ever. And Peter says, Amen. And then he passes away from this point on. This was his last letter on his dying bed. Let me conclude, if the Lord is long-suffering and is coming, then it gives us opportunity to live for Him. But to say that He's never coming, we put ourselves in the camp of the wicked. He's coming back, and we need to live for Him. We need to grow in Him. It is better late than never, isn't it? It's better late than never. Now, as I promised, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you haven't really given your heart to Him, What I mean by that is is if you hadn't said, Lord, I really want you into my heart, then today's the day. I want to give you that opportunity. Let's bow our heads. Those of you that are believers, you need to pray that the Spirit of God will move in the heart of those that don't know Him personally. I believe you'd know if you know God or not. And you know your own heart and the struggles that you have. Even the doubts. God wants to answer all those doubts. He wants to be there for you. And He can because He has been there for many, many, many people. And so if you have given your lives to Jesus Christ, but yet you know it it really wasn't a true conversion, sincere, then today's the day. I want you just to raise your hand and say, I really want Jesus today. I want Him in my heart. And and I'm going to, Take every, make every effort to, to make sure that he's there. And so if you're that person, why don't you just raise your hand and then just drop it. Jesus loved you so much. He, he died on the cross for you. He gave his life so that you could have eternal life. He knows that, that life is hard and tough and he wants to be there to help you through it. And he can do it. Just as he did with the children of Israel through the Red Sea when they thought everything was coming to an end. He wants you to call out to him. Just raise your hand as he's giving you this opportunity. He's going to wait. He's going to wait for you. 
We're not going to wait for you because we're going to end it right now. But if you don't want to at this time, then he's waiting for you. And when you're ready, he's willing. And so remember that, that as soon as you're ready, all you have to do is call out to him and he will answer you at any time. Father, I pray for the believers, Lord, that are here. I pray for growth, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they would have a hunger to grow. Just as in life, Lord, we hunger to grow up. When we're a toddler, we want to become a young kid. When we're a young kid, we want to be a teenager. When we're a teenager, we want to become a young adult. And when we're a young adult, we want to be a retired adult. Lord, so let us grow up in our spiritual walk with you, Lord. We pray that we would take all truth and knowledge of of your word, Lord, and apply it to our lives. That we would live a life worthy before you, Lord. Lord, help us to live in you and not outside, Lord, watching. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name.